Hello, I'm Anthony. Today we're going to take a look at track versions in Cubase. There are two different ways or two primary ways that you can record your information in Cubase such that you can perform multiple takes and from those different takes ultimately end up with a finished piece of music. So firstly, we really need to distinguish between track versions and the other idea, which is track lanes, in order to understand when to use each of them. Now I've made a video about track lanes, which I'll put a link to above. And in that demonstration, I comped or compiled together a single vocal performance from multiple different takes. So I took this phrase from one take, this phrase from another take, glued them all together to make one single finished product. That's where lanes shine, where you only want to hear one of those things at any given time. But within your potentially eight or 16 bar cycle, you're cutting different parts out of different sections and you want to be able to audition each of them very quickly, toggle backwards and forwards and ultimately put together your finished product. In the case of track versions, we're dealing with a completely different use case. Now we're dealing with the entire thing as a whole. So in the example we're going to have a look at today, we're dealing with eight bar sections of music. Those eight bar sections of music don't overlap in the way that they would if you wanted to use lanes. The concept behind track versions is that we're going to use one of these different track parts at any given time, but they don't overlap. And what it allows us to do is save on VST overhead because we only need one instance of each instrument, but we can record multiple different tracks and easily jump between those different tracks at any given time. The critical thing being that we're jumping in entire eight bar sections. We're not trying to take a bit from here and a bit from there. So with that distinction drawn, it's time to figure out how track versions actually work. Now the example I'm gonna give you today is a real world example. I've gone back in time to the beginning of an electronic piece that I was writing. Before we go any further, I'll play a couple of bars of this so that you can understand the kind of thing we're talking about. Okay, that's enough. We don't need any more than that. That was basically the original idea. And having written that idea, I thought, well, that's nice for an evolved thing a couple of minutes down the line but I actually want to start off this piece of music much simpler than this. In fact, I don't want any tonal modulation in this thing at all. If we have a look at this Omnisphere piece, for instance, you can see we've got some chords, the A minor, F, D minor to A minor pattern. Once again, that's all very well and good for when I'm up and running, but right at the outset of the piece, I thought, no, I want to step back from this. I just want to play um, a long suspended A minor and have no other chords in it. Now track versions are enabled by default in Cubase. You don't have to do anything. When you hover over the name of a track, you might notice this little arrow. That's your access to track versioning. If you never create a second track version, the functionality doesn't really activate. But if I click on that little drop down symbol, we get some options allowing us to create our first track version. We have the option to create a new version which is going to create a completely empty track. It looks like the parts disappeared and you think, you're thinking, hang on a minute, where's my old MIDI part gone? Well, don't panic. It's stored in the other track version. In the inspector on the left-hand side, you can toggle between these track versions very easily. So if I go back to version one, there's my MIDI part. Here's version two with no MIDI part in it. Now I'm going to undo that um, track version creation because more often than not, I find it more convenient to duplicate the version instead. If we choose that option, now we've created an identical second copy of the MIDI part, but these are different. I can now edit this copy and leave the original completely untouched. Now in a few moments, I'm gonna jump forwards in time and show you an evolution of this piece of music as it happened. And in this particular case, I actually happened to stick with the original part as version one and I edited the copy to be what I wanted it to be, which was to get rid of all of those notes and just have that first chord right at the outset. In fact, I think, if I remember rightly, I've done something like that. So now I just have that bedrock of A minor. Let's go up to the bass line and create a track version there as well. Once again, I'll duplicate the part and edit the copy. If I click on this MIDI part, what I'm actually clicking on there is the second version 
of the information that's currently stored on this track. They're currently identical. There's no difference in the MIDI part, but you do need to be careful if you're using track versions that you make sure you're editing the right part. Now that I've selected the second part, I can open it. And in this case, I'm gonna take all of those high notes and just drop them down an octave. So here's the simplified version of those two instruments playing together. Now, if you're gonna use track versions, it's pretty important to be disciplined with your version naming, because at the moment, chaos reigns. I have no idea what each of these parts contain. What I'm currently looking at here is track version B. This is the evolved version of the bass line. And so whatever is currently selected in the inspector in the left-hand side, that's the one I'm looking at. If I click where it says B1, I can now rename this. And you don't need to get too fancy with this. Just call it B in my case. The other track version, which is the simplified version, I'm gonna call A. Now that I've renamed those track versions, it's easy from the inspector to see what's going on, but it's not so easy from the tracks perspective. Well, if we activate our dropdown again, we have an option here called show version name in track list. If I select that, now the letter A appears next to the track name and I know exactly what's going on here. If I switch to form B, there's track version B and there's the bass line. Let's fix the version naming for this electronic piano sound. So I can visually see that this is part B, which means if I select the other one, that's gonna be part A. Okay, so far so good. We've only needed one instance of the VST plugin installed in Cubase to accomplish everything that we're doing so far. And we can toggle easily between form A and B. But as you see at the moment, they're completely independent. So I can have a baseline for form A, the electronic piano sound, is on form B. And whilst that's not absolutely hideous and is a perfectly reasonable creative thing to investigate when you're writing music this way, more often than not, I'm going to want to tie versions together so that I can toggle multiple tracks between different states simultaneously. Well, we can do that, but we need to go through a pre-process first. Even though we've renamed these track versions A and B, Cubase doesn't really understand what those tags mean. They're just letters if we want to generate a relationship between these two different track versions, we need to use the version ID. Can you see this ID column down the right hand side? Just before we go any further, actually, I want you to take a note of these IDs. On the bass track, we have IDs three and four. And on the JP track, the electric piano, we have IDs one and two. That's entirely internal. Cubase takes care of them. I don't have any direct interaction with it at this stage because I've not asked it to tie these tracks together. The process that we're going to do, however, where I multi-select these tracks, is to explicitly lock these IDs together. We're going to head up into the project menu, down into track versions, and the option that we're looking for is assign common version ID. If I execute that function, those IDs are going to change. In fact, you can see them, they're currently labeled three and four. Now the four has changed to a five. Let's have a look at the bass track, IDs three and five, JP Shimmer. The form A, which is the one that we've just locked together, has also been assigned a common ID number. So both of these tracks, form A, have been locked. Now I need to perform the same operation on B. Select both of those tracks, multi-select them, head into project, and again, assign a common version ID. Now form B has been given the ID six and it's gonna have that ID for all tracks labeled B. From this point onwards, if I select all of the tracks I'm interested in toggling and switch the track version, it switches the track version for every linked ID track. I'm just gonna have a look at one more thing in this version of the instrumental before we move on to a new project where I've evolved the ideas slightly. Let's have a look at this CS lead line. So this was the part that I recorded and this is a form B part. In other words, this is designed to move with these chord changes. So I'm carrying along with the, the change of chord to F. In fact, I actually stick on the F 
which then becomes third when we switch to the D chord. Which sounds pretty nice. And then I move back to the original phrase for the return to the A minor. So that's a form B chord, uh, sorry, pattern that I've just written there. Something that I dislike about track versions, and I really wish uh, Steinberg would fix this, is that if you don't have any alternative track versions, in other words, you're just stuck with your original track, you can't rename the track version at all. See, I'm double clicking where it says track version. It's locked at V1 until I create a second version of the piece. And now I am able to edit these and I can call that form B. So you're gonna to need to devise some method of labeling your track versions when they're not actually track versions. You could do it inside the track name itself, for instance. I'm gonna open a project now from a couple of days later when I'd written some more music for it. Okay, so things have moved on significantly from here. You can see that we've got some new parts added, but you can see that I've maintained the same naming convention. So I have four unmuted tracks here. If I select all of them, I can toggle easily between forms A and B. And if we have a look at that lead track that we saw in the earlier project, you can see that I've now created a part A for it and part B, which is my original part, is now sat over here. There's been a little bit of reworking of the baseline, uh, but essentially this is still the same piece of music. So all of this music is designed to be pedaling over that constant A minor chord and deliberately not introducing uh, the harmonic variation that part B has. The beauty of track versions and why I like to use it in a piece of music like this, which is very evolving, is that I get to play with multiple different parts and I can mute any of these and bring new stuff in and I can audition all of these parts together without having to copy eight bar chunks of music to, to, to audition or to try new ideas. I get to play in my eight bar sandpit and simply switch between different versions of the piece as it's evolving very dynamically. So here's a couple of extra sounds that I'm auditioning at this stage. And once again, these have got no tonal uh, harmonic variation. So they, they work nicely over that pedaling A minor. So let's say I want to toggle between forms A and B. My filter sequence track at the moment um, is, is just pedaling on A, nice and simple. But let's say I want to create a second version of that that actually moves with the notes down to the F and then D and then A at the end. Well, as you saw earlier, I can create a new version of it from this point onwards, label it B and do all of that kind of stuff. But there's an alternative method that we can employ as well. Let's choose the bass tracks and my filter sequence. And now I'm gonna to switch to form B. Cubase is gonna throw this message up. Let's have a look at it. You're trying to activate form B. It's actually picked on the track base, but it doesn't matter. It's basically all of the tracks that have this associated ID 16. This track version doesn't exist on the filter sequence track. What do you want to do? Well, I now get to shortcut that manual process where I had to assign the common ID. Cubase will implicitly do it for me. And that's the default and generally uh, preferred option. Duplicate the current track version and assign a common version ID. That's exactly what I want to do. The other options are pretty self-explanatory. I'm not gonna labor over them. I'm just gonna choose okay because this is the thing that you're most often going to want to do. So we click okay. Now, if we single click on the filter sequence, we can have a look at what it's done. So here is my track version B, 16. We've got one remaining issue to sort. If I wanna tie the existing filter sequence um, version, currently called V1, if I wanna tie that strictly to form A, I'm gonna to need to do that manually because I haven't already done it. And there's no implicit operation that would allow Cubase to kind of understand that I need to link those things together. So this is a manual process. And what we need to do is select all of the tracks that are currently part of this group. You see that I've selected every track that currently has a form A track version. 
And as you can see, it's track version 15. So that's my kind of my baseline. I'm going to add a new thing into this collection. And the thing that I'm going to add is my filter sequence. Press control on my keyboard to add this track to the others. The second thing about track versions I don't like is that it's now going to reassign all of those IDs. If I select this common version ID, now it's 18. So don't get hung up on this ID number. Cubase is going to use its own internal kind of cataloging to keep track of this stuff. I would like to be able to add filter sequence to ID 15. In other words, edit its own unique ID. You can't do that. Rather than selecting all of those parts manually, I selected every form A part. I can have Cubase do that for me implicitly. All I have to do is select any part that's a member of the collection that I'm interested in. And from the little drop down, select tracks with the same version ID. And that will shortcut that process so that I don't have to do it manually. You can see now that filter sequence has been brought along for the ride because that is now part of this new collection. All right, you've got to the part of the songwriting process where you've finished laying all of your ideas down. You've got your parts A, Bs, Cs, whatever. You're ready to actually turn it into a fully fledged piece of music now. The way that I like to perform this part of the process is to convert these versions into lanes so that I have access to all of the parts. Let's just deal with the baseline by way of example, heading to project, track versions. And now I'm gonna create lanes from versions. If we open our lanes, there are my two parts. And as normal, when Cubase creates lanes, it mutes all but one part because I can now pick that part up, drag it off horizontally, unmute it. And now I've got access to form A and B side by side. I can close my lanes down and now I'm going to start working horizontally. You can perform this operation on multiple tracks simultaneously. So you can basically explode your entire project in one go. I'll just do a couple of tracks here, create lanes from versions. And now each one of those tracks has its own separate part. And as you can see, there's all my form A's. There's all of my form B's. The way that Cubase executes this operation is to make a track version that contains lanes. So you've still got all of your old information in the background, but now this new track version is the one that has the lanes on. So if at any point you wanna go back to your old process where you start adding more parts on in your track versioning methodology, all of that information is still there. None of it's been deleted. And that'll do us for today's demonstration. Hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, check out my Patreon and YouTube channel member links below if you'd like to help support my channel. Uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.